Stanford University. Good morning. I'm honored to op open this second day. We all look forward to um, more stimulating and interesting discussions. Um, we have two uh, speakers in this first session. Elazar Khan is Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, Director of the School of International and Public Affairs Human Rights Concentration, and Director of Columbia's Institute for the Study of Human Rights. Um, Professor Barkhan is also Founding Director of the Institute for Historical Justice and Reconciliation in The Hague. Um, he has written a great deal on issues of human rights, uh, conflict resolution, and reconciliation. Uh, his long list of publications include The Guilt of Nations, Restitution and Negoti Negotiating Historical Injustice, Taking Wrongs Seriously, Apologize and Reconciliation, um, Planning the Stones, Naming the Bones, Cultural Property and the Negotiation of Nation and, Ethn and Ethnic Identity. So what I am uh, going to do is uh, to, talk, to try and put in context the engagement with history, memory, questions of redress, and conflict resolution. Uh, Norman is not here, but yesterday I, I want to pick up from the question that he raised at the end of the day, what does it matter? And I want to, uh, uh, to suggest that um, we don't have a choice. So it's not a question of whether we choose to, by we I mean as a society, not as individuals. Individuals, we always have a choice. But uh, that history and memory, historical justice and memory, is engaging different constituencies together that reinforce each other. And I'd like to, put, to suggest to that there are um, five different constituencies that are involved with it. First is the ones that address questions of historical conflict. And by historical conflict, I mean conflicts that have become cold conflicts that have ceased but continue to influence contemporary societies. So the, we heard about the Armenians and Turk uh, conflict that is notwithstanding contemporary issues as, over Azerbaijan, the border, etc. the core of the conflict is the genocide. Uh, Japan, colonialism, still a very much a conflict that, is, that has dr a great influence on contemporary society, um, but it's a cold conflict in that regard. Um, so the first constituency is one of historical conflicts. The second um, constituency is the transitional justice crowd. Transitional justice has developed uh, since late 80s, primarily Latin America, then South Africa, and Eastern Europe in different ways. But it uh, has become very much a bread and butter issue in questions of transitions. In questions of transitions from authoritarian to dictatorships, it engages the past, so under the category of facing the past, it's a very important constituency, and I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. The third category, the third issue is conflict, re, uh, con ongoing conflict situations, whereby the past is informing contemporary uh, conflicts and addressing those uh, historical uh, sources of the conflict is at the heart of the conflict. An example for that would be uh, Serbia and the disintegration of uh, Yugoslavia. So, for instance, if, we re if you recall, the centrality of the concept of the Chetnik into, into the animosity between the Serb and the Croats and the Bosnians was very both self-affirming for, for Serb nationalists and defamatory from the Croats. So in some respects, and I don't want to argue that it's the exclusivity, and some would say Kosovo, and Co Battle of Kosovo, but that's an issue where the history is really uh, very much was uh, reenacted in the contemporary conflict. That's the third category. 
And I would say that it's really critical when we come to talk about peace building, peace process, conflict resolution, etc. The fourth category is the academic engagement with history, with, with, with memory studies. And that is whether it's postmodernism, whether it's post postmodernism, literature, philosophy, a lot of disciplines that engage with the questions of memory, but without integrating their work or not either informing or being informed by the political side of the engagements with these all these areas all these discourses coexist with each other at a sometimes more and sometimes less informed with it the fifth category is the knowledge producers of civil society activists civil society advocates and I'd also, I'll, if I have time, I'll say a few more words about it. But uh, Amir mentioned yesterday, the, shared in his opening comments, some of those productions uh, the, about the uh, Palestine-Israel histories, which, a result of a, which is an example of a result of, notwithstanding the quality, so, I'm, I'm, but as an activity, uh, is a result of an NGO, a, initiation that we started, I want to say about eight, nine years ago in Salzburg, then it moved to The Hague and brought together groups that tried both from Palestinian and Israelis, but not exclusively. We had uh, Muge participated in groups that we sponsored, in part we sponsored, it was independent for us, but in, among Turkish Armenians, there were groups that operated in the former Yugoslavia between the various groups and a center that exists in, uh, in Novi Sad now. So, but this is a, no, it's not the tip, it's a spot on an iceberg. I don't want to, uh, without ranking, but there is a lot of activism that is going on in knowledge production. All of that is to say that there is a sense for people who are engaging in those issues that that has become some kind of a holy grail and that the concepts are very easily or assumingly transferable from one area to the other. I want to suggest some uh, delineation here and some uh, reservations. The first thing is that I think we need to try and create a typology of these conflicts because some of the transitions are political and some of the transitions include conflicts that are ethnic identity based. Those types of conflict are, I would suggest to you, very, very different. When we look at Argentina and the success in Argentina, there is no, there is no constituency for the colonels. For the authoritarian regime, there is no continuity in the second generation. A transition that takes place reaches an end, and uh, then it has the memory of it continues, but not the constituency that continues to carry the grievances. So if we have the grandmothers of the children that disappeared, there is no uh, alternative group that actually we are violating their uh, narratives. So it's more one-sided. Transitions are, of political cases are one-sided. Ethnic, however, identity uh, conflicts, as we see around the table, continue into the second and third and fourth generations, and it's a continuous struggle over narrative. So there are two different groups, and I think that some of the enthusiasm that is manifested in terms of a historical redress is informed by conflicts that are primarily uh, political without taking due uh, account on the limitations that identity conflicts uh, in, uh, impose on this, on, on this process. Uh, so I want just uh, to keep that in mind. Uh, and then the other question is how can historical study, and Norman, you said, you, you mentioned, what, what, was the, what, what impact does it make in, in, to, in tomorrow's, in today's world? 
what impact will it make? And we, we had a little exchange about Germany and France and whether Germany and France as the ultimate reconciliation after hundreds of years of wars, whether that can be a lesson to somewhere else. Um, it's hard to say. We don't have enough a variable, a, enough cases in order to actually create some kind of a political, a, a policy a study that will, that will explain that. But what we can say is that, but that the stakeholders, that protagonists in conflict want to have their story told and their a, perspective being included, historical perspective being the base of the conflict. On one hand, on the other hand, the UN and the international community increasingly talk about pre prevention, about root causes, about conflict resolution, but there is a huge scarcity. I don't know of a single attempt to address root causes, historical root causes, when it comes to conflict resolution, although that is recognized as a cause of the conflict in many places. But peace building or peace process by the international community doesn't address it. So I think the challenge for both activists and scholars who are interested in being involved with that is how to pro uh, formulate a mechanism and methodology that actually can address this kind of uh, intervention. Um, <clears throat> the questions of redress has become very much related to the catchphrase of human rights that is, I would like to submit to you, is the most dominant um, political ideology, global political ideology today. If you want to argue your case, you dress it up as a human right and you have made the justification. So whether all the questions of ethics and politics is being beamed through the prism of human rights, as a form of validation. In the cases for our, the topics among, uh, that we're dealing with, so there is a formulation of the right to truth. There is a, refer, there is a formulation of the right to reparation. And famously, the right to return for refugees. That uh, formulation of all of that is the questions of, uh, of rights is one of the ways in which the redress has become a human right uh, in political uh, discourse. Um, th that means that there is an expectation that uh, past violence will be redressed. How, that expect how to redress, it's very difficult. Because what does it mean, a uh, right to truth? Different uh, sets of experts understand the questions of truth. This is not a, question, a philosophical question, what is truth? But actually, how does the international community answer the question with what kind of mechanism? So you have trials, truth commissions, to, uh, historical commissions. Uh, these are sort of three examples of mechanisms that are very uh, diverse, don't really speak to each other but convey the appearance and the urge and the needs to, address, to, um, to embrace truth. So historians have struggled with the questions of object, objectivity and truth in terms of a, a historiosophical questions for more than, a, by now we should probably say almost two centuries, but uh, that doesn't mean to say that any of us who are historians around the table would have difficulty in the studies that we do ourselves to actually claim that we are trying to approximate the truth as much as possible. Uh, that certainly is true with regard to the audience of the historical discourse. When you come to truth commissions, by and large, truth commissions take testimonies. There's almost a competition of more the merrier. So if South Africa took 20,000 uh, testimonies, Kenya is doing its truth commission, which is very problematic, but it takes 30,000 testimonies. 
is what do you do with 30,000 testimonies? How, how these testimonies impact the study of the truth, of the historical knowledge? How does this improve? It is clearly the truth commissions are focused on the voices of the victims, but it's very far from understanding the historical truth as, profession, as professional historians would understand it. Trials are a completely pro different problem. Sometimes you have experts, historians, that participate in trials. Uh, trials are very good in producing materials that will be good for historians in the long run, but the, uh, the narrative that the trial produces is subject to judicial process, to limitations of, what they, of, of court rulings, etc., and is very far from what the professional historians would um, accept as the, an approximation of a historical narrative. Um, <clears throat> All of that is to say that there are disparate discourses and there is a lack of a field in what I, what I think is a great need to have some kind of coalescence of various discourses. And when you bring people for the, from different dis, uh, discourses together, you get oftentimes a lot of good insights. Uh, most of the a lot of the productions of the conflict is done through uh, civil society, as I mentioned. Uh, whether that's museums, whether it's memorials, uh, whether it's advocacy, whether it's working with victims, depend at what level of uh, work we are talking about, uh, it's clearly that there is a great desire out there. I haven't mentioned yet textbooks, and I'm not going to talk about textbooks, but clearly textbooks is another a huge area in which through uh, the history and the memory is being, is being consumed uh, by, by the society. So, um, <clears throat> I think that the uh, I don't have much time, um, but uh, <coughs> okay. So, how should society address questions of uh, historical injustices or questions? Or how do they choose to address it? So, we mentioned Spain yesterday. Uh, Spain chose after the transition to freeze the, their engagement with the past and to move into a democracy with doing very little by ways of redress. It took about 35 years, uh, 30 years, until they started to revisit the question of the civil war primarily, and the Franco regime is still more problematic, but it is done in such a way that it's not tearing the society apart. On the other end, if you ask transitional justice in the, uh, activists today, if it is not done exactly today, it will never take place. So there is a press, there, there is a pressure to approach, to deal with the past immediately during a transition. Because if we don't do it in, during a transition, it will be uh, bygone. Nobody will ever address it. So one of the things that we learn from transitions, both political and otherwise, is actually that that claim is not necessarily true. Even in Argentina, where there has been a amnesty, I mean, there were first trials, then amnesty, then delays, recently there has been few trials, a re a renewed trial of a few of the perpetrators. So while it is not true, the urge is to really address the, the, the past immediately during the transition. But then you look at countries like Rwanda. Rwanda is a good example where history is being repressed and where the Tutsi's narrative is the exclusive narrative while the Hutu narrative and the suffering, I'm not creating parity by the way, but there have been tens of thousands of Hutus have been slaughtered and the, some of them were under captives under the genocidaires, etc. and the, I don't need to go into the descriptions of what happened, but it's clearly that Rwanda today, whether through the Gachacha courts, you know, the, is that okay, the Gachacha court? The, the, pop, the, the popular semi, the 
semi-judicial mechanism around Rwanda where about 100,000 uh, perpetrators were brought into community justice. So the truth that is, that is coming up in, during those community uh, courts is such that people, when there is criticism of the Tutsis narrative, the, it is not being recorded. It's being repressed. So the truth that is coming through the Gachacha courts, although it's supposedly popular, it supposedly it does bring the perspective of the victims, it is very unidimensional. And one can assume that given a country where you have 85 to 15 percent uh, demographic relationship, a conflict will emerge in the future, and when there is no acknowledgement of the pain of the Hutus, that may cam come back to bite the society in a very uh, violent manner. So you say, well, this is really critical. This is something that has to be addressed. On the other hand, you may say, well, if we look at the Spanish example, maybe there has to be a generation or more before the society, where maybe you need to establish institutions before that kind of a addressing of the historical narrative of the violence, the society can be ready for that. So what we know is that acknowledgement is extremely important. Acknowledgement of, is the first form of redress. And the example, obviously, from uh, Germany is uh, most illuminating and provides a model for other societies to try and emulate in that regard. But beside acknowledgement, I think other forms of redress are also symbolic. And we have to recognize that, that at the end of the day, uh, what, whether we're talking about material, whether we're talking material redress, reparation, restitution, whether we talk about a judicial form of uh, redress, accountability, all of those are primarily, and I would say exclusively, symbolic. Uh, I don't know of any case where there has been any form of redress that is uh, non-symbolic. The example that I know that is most widespread, uh, the most extensive is obviously Germany. Germany paid reparation, and people around the table who know it better than me, but I would assume roughly around 100 billion. We just need to choose the currency, but I think that it's roughly about, over the years, about 100 billion, which is a lot of money for the victims but very negligible if you compare it to GNP over 60 years or what is or it now? Or what was taken. And that would be the case in every instance that you can imagine. We're talking about ma violence of mass of uh, uh, crimes of atrocity, whether it's genocide, ethnic cleansing, displacement, whatever, it's not replaceable. So this tension between acknowledgement and actual reparation and restitution is one aspect that is very much part of the discourse. And because there are the related but separate discourses, there is the expectation when the language of legal accountability is being employed that there is some model of the rights of a reparation, that there is some model or some example of actual material uh, reparation, almost use the German uh, right of doing good again, the Wider Gutmachung. This is an expectation, but not one that has been implemented anywhere. Uh, I think that uh, the challenge now, from my perspective and from the kind of work that I'm doing, is to develop a field to develop a network of people who work on different aspects of questions of accountability and dialogue. And in some places, the language of accountability is much more pertinent than of dialogue. In others, accountability doesn't get you anywhere. It's not, uh, the, the whole discussion is about dialogue. And to try and figure out how can such an approach 
be integrated into the prevention. The UN and the international community has developed over the last 10, less than 10 years, but uh, the, right, the responsibility to protect. And the responsibility to protect or to prevent has in its nature the challenge to include the root causes of conflict. When do conflicts erupt? We don't know. Historical memory of violence does not necessarily lead to reconciliation, but it doesn't necessarily also lead to violence. I think we just uh, have to look at Eastern Europe after the Cold War to realize the number of conflicts that did not erupt, to think about the Ukrainians and the Poles or uh, uh, the Baltics, and to imagine that although the history of violence was as bad as anywhere, if not worse, it did not deteriorate to anything like the former Yugoslavia. And the answers, when we answer why did the one conflict erupt is a very pertinent question. We have to remember to, have, we have to, remember to ask why didn't other conflicts erupt which had a similar, uh, so to speak, root causes. With that in mind, I think that, uh, and I hope, that the kind of work that we are doing uh, in terms of memory has ramifications for conflict prevention in the future. And I think that this is just by way of opening comments, and I really would like to engage the conversation. I would like to uh, just talk for a second about the German case. Now, at Nuremberg, and share a personal experience also, at Nuremberg, the idea of personal culpability was cast very widely, so it included the SS, the Wehrmacht up to a certain degree, membership in the Nazi party, and if you look at the definition, something like 10 million Germans, at least, were seen as personally culpable for what happened according to the Nuremberg definitions. Now, what happened as a result? The Germans paid reparations fairly the early, 53, but they didn't dream, of course, of having 10 million people appear in court. And the result was that in the time I began going to Germany in the 70s, people were perfectly happy to pay reparations. There, were a no, there was no condition under which they were willing to accuse or condemn personal family members for what they had done. And that required another generation. In other words, the, the grandparents or great grandparents were far enough away so you were not condemning people you knew. And I think that is an important point because the question of personal culpability is something that sometimes gets in the way of reconciliation. I think that's very important and I think that perhaps I didn't explicate it uh, clearly enough. Memory, acknowledgement, it's a reconciliation is not a place, it's a process. It doesn't happen and then it ends. It happens and then it grows, and then it, it, it transformed. And, it, and so what starts at one phase, it I mean, until you, you, your prediction notwithstanding about 20, 2300 or whatever, 20, whatever you, you expect the piece to succeed. But the, I think that the process, as long as the two protagonist groups have animosity, the process of reconciliation has to continue. It, does, it, it doesn't work like the Japanese say, we apologized enough. You didn't apologize enough if the victim side doesn't think that you apologized enough. It's a dialogue. It's a process. In East, in East Asia, you can't talk about accountability, and there's nobody's talking really about accountability. The question is whether there'll be, the Japanese will be willing to hear now, when I say the Japanese, and that's a good case because nobody knows anything about it here, so at least let's, I, I don't. But uh, in, 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 the, in Northeast Asia, the question of what should the Japanese account for? What should they apologize for? How much is the, the relationship, the historical relationship is overwhelming, or dominating the contemporary relations? Is a, clear, is a clear example that there is no just forgetting. But just like in Turkey, where the a process of acknowledgement is very central to the process of democratization within Turkey, questions of freedom of speech, etc., Korea, which is on the receiving end from Japan, 
actually involved itself greatly with questions with internal uh, criminal activity. So whether the dictatorships, whether the collaboration, etc. So the process that started with Japan has become even more important domestically. And areas that I'm sure people are more familiar here, whether it's France or other places in Europe, the process of the discussions of redress actually raises a lot of uh, in, uh, hidden and buried issues domestically. Uh, as from your vast knowledge of the field, institutions, etc., etc., if we freeze for a moment where we are in the question of Israel-Palestine, and you talk to us as academics and people involved, you know, with the question, what do you think is the most effective, the most needed thing, especially our community should do, from a perspective and from your knowledge about where we are today? Well, let's take the question. Sure. Let me write it down. Uh, my question goes uh, a little bit in the same direction because uh, uh, what is dominating the public discourse are the conflicting narratives of, uh, so to say, uh, parties in this conflict. My question is about the role of the state because uh, the state has to uh, so has a kind of neutral uh, uh, ground, a kind of stage to negotiate these different or these conflicting narratives. Uh, and you mentioned um, uh, museums, you mentioned textbooks. Uh, it is a difference bet between a community museum and uh, the state museum of history. And it's no, uh, no uh, um, so to say, uh, coincidence that some states do not have a history museum because you could never agree about the history. But if you look at the textbooks, and each state has schools and has to have textbooks, uh, you have to find, so to say, a kind of formula which uh, is a basis or which is a kind of, a, so to say, shared understanding of events, of conflicts, you never come to a kind of consensus. And I mentioned yesterday the Austrian Civil War, uh, the, the formula of a shared guilt was established for some decades. So my question is, what do you think uh, is the role of state institutions like uh, uh, Ministry of Education, uh, Ministry of Culture, which are producing this kind of, I don't know, it's neutral, uh, so to say, perspectives. Uh, yeah, I would like to relate to what you said about like these processes would not go to the cause of the conflict, but would relate to the possibility. You said that when you, there's a trial, and there's a process of solving the dispute, at least from a legal point of view, that process would not go into the causes of, of the dispute. Well, how it, am I correct? I, Maybe I didn't just... I think, the I think you know, if I would maybe ask a question, you can, you can relate. Uh, you have to differentiate between the formal process and the informal process. The former process only takes place after there's a lot of things going around in society. It doesn't just come out of the blue. It's, it's a combination of all kinds of things happening. And then when you reach the legal process in which a dispute is, is brought before a certain tribunal, it's not just like that process. It's, it's an, the evolution of, of social and, and awareness of society at large. And so when you discuss a process, you cannot say that this is intact. It's, it's something independent. It's, it's within the society. It's lived society. Uh, and what came to mind was Eichmann. The Eichmann trial. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. Why did the, the court allow the admission of all kinds of evidence you know, about how the, the Holocaust developed when the culpability of this Eichmann could have been restricted to but the process did take that uh, turn, and, and I think it was very, th that's why the Eichmann trial is, is very important in Israel, because it did relate and it tended to go to the causes of how things develop. So, I, I, I'll clarify. Okay. Shall we start? Yeah, then we'll take another one. Okay. So, first of all, in terms of trials, I may have not uh, made it clear enough. Uh, 
when you look at the, when there is a search for truth, the trials are confined by the process. Now, Hausner was not quite confined, as some people would have liked him to have been. And clearly, the impact of the Eichmann trial on the development of both in societies, on the questions of the whole recognitions of the Holocaust, etc., was enormous. Uh, notwithstanding the criticism of the trial itself. But the, tr the historical truth and what the court is determined the truth is, is impacted by the way of the expert testimonies, by the way in which the process develops. So when you look at the ICTY, the, the tribunals for former Yugoslavia, or where you look at Rwanda, uh, there is a great deal of frustration by what is the truth that is being generated by, through the verdict about the historical truth. In most cases, the, what is the, the verdict is limited to the culpability of the individuals at question, to the acts that are being, to the indictment. It does not necessarily, the Eichmann trial in many ways uh, was an exception in that regard in the, wi in the wide swa uh, swap that it, uh, that it addresses. <coughs> But uh, if you... Hasner was also something similar. Well, when you go into these things, you go into the whole, the whole issue. Right, but the, but, the, but the trial is one verdict. It's, I mean, the judgment is one, ver it's, it's one verdict. It doesn't stand for the historical truth. It's one, look, we don't have definitive. It's not that I'm saying that there is another, look at this volume that will give you the definitive... The whole issue of truth, of history, of historical writing is a process of negotiations. And you have, the, so the trials is not definitive in the sense that it actually resolves the conflict. That's all I meant. It's not that it's not an important voice. Sometimes, uh, uh, when you look, for instance, at Charles Taylor uh, indict, uh, indictment and the verdict that came, what is it, two weeks ago or so. So he, uh, he was uh, in, uh, found guilty for aiding and abating in the Sierra Leone, not for all the crimes in Liberia, not for all the other crimes that he was involved. He wasn't actually for perpetrating a genocide or perpetrating the crimes. So as an outsider, when you look and you say, OK, so of all these things, what do we know? We know a sliver. I don't minimize it. I, context I try to contextualize it. Um, the role of the, uh, of the state in conflict narrative. Um, sure, the state has a great deal of power. Uh, and it always is a major actor. The question is, how is it being, wh what's the, so sometimes it's through the production of knowledge. Sometimes it's through the repression of knowledge. Uh, when you have uh, memorials, Sometimes we, we say there's no memorials to the victims, but that doesn't mean to say there's no memorials through nationalist memo uh, memor memorials to the perpetrators. When you look at Bosnia, and when you see after the war, there were 13, I think, 13, 10 and 3 in the Republika Sperska educational authorities. None of them dealt with history. All of it is greatly antagonistic, so the state has a great power of not doing something or of inflaming the conflict. There's a tendency, at least in the discourse, to assume that more discourse will necessarily be better. We forget that the main producers of knowledge, of history, and of memory are nationalists and <coughs> a spewing hate. Whether you look at it in the societies that are primarily conversation, the, con the topic of conversation around the table, it's just as true as in other societies. Right-wing nationalists always produce, I want to say more, in many cases, not always, in many cases. So when you ask about the role of the state, we are desperate to find a good positive role to the state, but the state is always active is always producing, sometimes by not addressing history. In Rwanda, there is no history in the textbooks. It's just uh, in, uh, in uh, Timor-Leste, there's no history in the textbooks. So that is a, 
really critical, important role. Amir, your question, um, I'm very parochial when it comes to these things. I don't think that when we talk about societies, specific societies, there are any societies that are homogeneous. So the role that I would like to see and to envision for scholars is to increase the fissures in a, and the disagreements within the society so that to work on to the degree that there is a possibility of cooperation and working together among the most like-minded individuals from different societies to pursue a share, I'm going to say that and explain it later, so don't jump immediately, but to, to, to pursue shared narratives that the differences within these shared narratives are methodological, not identity-based. So I don't imagine ever, when I say shared narrative, I don't talk about, I don't imagine a kumbaya situation. It's not a question that in the, we had yesterday conversations about parity, etc. And It's very problematic. And I assume that it will be problematic. But the question is whether the division between people who jointly try and write a text is primarily ethnic, identity-based difference, or whether the difference is methodological. Because methodologically, we won't agree with each other, regardless of anything. So uh, ideally, I would say that those that are two steps more distant than the daily uh, grit of politics to work together is to try and produce, to delineate areas of agreement and disagreement. Where, can, where does the disagreement take place? Why does the disagreement take place? Is it questions of methodology, data, perspective, etc.? So that at some point, those can be provide building blocks, whether it's for textbooks or other things that can be for, uh, disseminated to a wider society. And how does acknowledgement yeah, fit into the story? Let's take one more round of yeah. questions. Yeah, I have uh, Nadim, Omer, Simon, Yes, my question is about the historical causes, really, but this last remark about ethnic-based uh, narrative. Narratives are not always in conflict ethnic-based. Sometimes they are power-based. Sometimes they are colonial, colonialist, colonized. It's not, not necessarily. I think we should expand the way we I'm think. I'm sorry, I used <coughs> In any the, case, my no, question. Just as an explanation, uh, when I said ethnic, it was a shortened to identity. No, but, but I said it's not. I mean, in the Israeli Palestinian case, it's not even identity in the ethnic sense. In this room, there are people who believe this is a colonial project who are Jews. So it's not, it's not ethnic at all. In any case, the question about historical uh, El Azar, uh, let me see if I understood you right. Are you saying that there are no cases where the historical causes of conflict were addressed? If so, what about South Africa? South Africa is a case in which it's clear that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out with a, uh, with a, a no fundamental report that apartheid was wrong. And apartheid is a system has to be replaced by a democratic system, one person, one vote. It went into the root of the conflict. If this is not going into the root of the conflict, I don't know what's going into the root of the conflict. In Germany, the same thing, but under, under the power of external forces. So I think it's, it's a sweeping, it's a little sweeping generalization to say that there are no cases of. I think it depends, as you probably well know, on the power relations between, in the transitional, in the transitional government between the, the power holders. So in Chile, it's taking time to address that because there are some of the power holders in the government who are coming, who came from the older regime. In, in El Salvador, the same thing. So there is a whole range of how much the historical justice, uh, the historical issues uh, have been uh, have been addressed. The same thing with with uh, with uh, compensation. 
the United States gave compensation to the address the issue of, of, the, of the Japanese. I think you wrote about that and, and gave them uh, compensation and so on. So it, 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 that there's a whole range of issues there. Um, I think my, my question sort of refers also to yesterday's discussion about the role of violence in all this. And, and I'll explain it. You know, in, in The Guilt of Nations, you, 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 write, you, you take, I think, rightly as the best example the case of uh, German restitution. Now, of course, German restitution comes because Germany is entirely defeated. It's, it, it ceases to exist as a nation, and whatever happens after that is because it has been eradicated as a political entity and then is reconstituted. And that also has to do with the relations between Germany and France. So it's not that the Germans and the French in 1945 say, well, okay, now we've tried to kill each other, it, it didn't work, let's try another way. Because the Germans are totally defeated, uh, which doesn't happen in World War I, of course, which is one reason that we have a continuation of violence between these states. The second example that you mentioned that I'm interested in is the case of Eastern Europe. So what ultimately creates the possibility for reconciliation between Poles and Ukrainians. They are mixed. They are mixed through genocide, through ethnic cleansing, and through population policies, through deportations. So where you have countries that had huge minorities, these minorities don't exist anymore. They've either been killed or moved. Um, you mentioned the case of Japan, and of course Japan is very similar to Germany in this. Uh, Japan can talk about um, apologizing because it was defeated entirely. And so what I'm, what I'm wondering here is what, how do we build this into a model? Or are we talking about two totally different things? You have conflicts such as in South Africa, such as in Israel-Palestine, um, such as in Guatemala. And then you have these cases in which we can see them as a positive way of doing it, but the results of that, the, the causes of that, are completely different. The causes are that there was war, conflict, and a, a, a violent resolution, if you like, of the original causes of that conflict. That is, that either power was completely undermined, or the populations that were mixed were unmixed. Thank you. Yes. Please start to try to be brief, so we'll have enough time. Mm -hmm. Simon, and then... <coughs> I was going to just go back to your opening comments about the various categories that you drew out at the beginning. And the, of, I think this is an act of self-defense, probably. Um, the fourth category you described as one where you have academic discourse uninformed by present political affairs. <coughs> and um, obviously, it was incredibly interesting you hearing about your historically informed approach to assessments about whether someone's apologized enough or uh, whether they should apologize at all. Um, but if you look at your fourth category, and, and, and you're now going to make it the most generous preface to my own paper, um, <laughs> what possible contribution do you think that that fourth category can make? And we'll see if uh, we, what I do tests it or confirms it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no? I'd like to ask you, as now, to apply your approach to to our case. I find it interesting that we are going around in some kind of uh, abstract uh, examples and other examples. What do you think should be done? I'm, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think should be done? The, the government of Israel takes you as its advisor on issues of historical responsibility. <laughs> what, what, what do you think you would recommend? Uh, apology, acknowledgement, uh, uh, compensation for the land and houses. From whom? Apologies right, from no. whom? <laughs> That's I'm, I'm let, you know, let him. Uh, I, I, I know him. I know him. I, I know. So I'm, I'm just curious, both in terms of what you think, and I think that we should speak about the real thing. The real thing is, is this, this issue. What do we, how do we think that we want to do it? Thank you, Sikha. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm coming here as a, as a guest. I'm a um, lecturer, a visiting lecturer at the German department right now. And I've been wondering, we, we treat these categories like truth, uh, reconciliation, 
um, history, justice, we might add peace, reparation, um, as elements of one big flow of, of dealing with the past or post-conflict situation, but what if these categories were contradicting at times? Um, societies at certain times might seek for reconciliation because in immediate post-conflict situations like Rwanda, there is no way, as we can deal with the depth of the crimes that happen, because there is no way of having some kind of peaceful living together in the immediate post-conflict situation. What if reparation is affordable in the, in the deepest sense of the word for Germany, but not any deeper sense of justice apart from what had happened in the Nuremberg trial, because the German, at least the West German society, obviously needed to have some agreement that would make it easier for them um, to accept that this was a small bunch of, of, of criminals who perpetrated uh, all the war crimes and the Holocaust, but we as a society are, are unharmed because the effect of it was that an administration that consisted mainly of at least collaborators, if not war crime, could sort of transform itself into a democratic, uh, democratic society as well, which is, I would say, very much needed for the reconciliation process. So I find it very difficult to see how you know truth and truth and justice and reconciliation would not contradict each other, especially in the Israeli Palestinian case. Thank you. Yes, I, I, one thing just from uh, you know thinking of what we've done, at least a few of us have done with respect to the Turkish Armenian case. Uh, I think what probably ought to come before. Uh, formal institutional approaches like Truth and Reconciliation Committee is, uh, and that is I think where scholars are so significant, is for scholars to start developing a common language. And, and that uh, we try to do in our case uh, through the workshop uh, of Armenian Turkish scholarship. And uh, what was very uh, imp important for me in that context was teaching a course uh, with an Armenian colleague of mine on Turkish-Armenian relations, and it was fascinating uh, to see, for example, I mean, we learned much more from each other than, well, the students did too, probably. But, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, I the US, the course in the US. In the US at the no. University of Michigan, what was very significant was what we considered significant events in Turkish history, the Armenians did not at all care about. What they considered significant we didn't at all, I mean, so we were just shocked talking to each other saying, you think this isn't important? You know, he wanted me right. to talk about the Serb Treaty. I said, what Serb Treaty? We don't even remember. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was very interesting. Yeah. The other thing I think uh, scholarly, intellectually we can do is now we have a set of graduate students. Turkish students are obligated to learn Armenian. Armenian st students are obligated to learn Turkish and Ottoman, and I, I'm teaching a couple at the moment because I happen to know Ottoman. We haven't had that opportunity to know both sides, but I think the next generation, at least what we could do with our own students, is to ensure that they have access to two languages if you know the issue is over more than one language. Assuming they say Turkish and Armenian. Two generations forward. Okay, thank you. Well, or they will, yes, well, yeah. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. Um, the root causes. So, probably I was too sweeping in that sense because there's at some level of abstraction and generalizations, obviously, root causes are addressed. But when you look at South Africa, the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there is, an, I would say, an inverse proportion between the view of it as successful and the distance from South Africa. The farther away you get from South Africa, the more successful it seemed. In South Africa, the questions of reparation, which the Truth Commissions really had to address, was never addressed. It is a very, there is very critical view of the narratives that he told. It's, you're, you're right at the most basic level about apartheid, but did it provide amnesty and impunity? There's a lot of criticism of the Truth Commission. And that speaks to the question uh, at the back of the room as well in terms of the, the internal contradictions between various goals 
That's the nature of things. That's the nature of politics. There's always, so when you look at peace versus justice, that's the initial uh, discourse in which the South African Truth Commission was tried to be understood. Peace versus justice, impunity versus peace. Um, over time, there's been enough examples to try and argue. I'm not su suggesting never necessarily successful, but to try and argue that peace and justice can work. You can both bring some individuals to justice and create peace. And I guess that in different dilution, uh, you can have components that include. So when we talked about uh, the, the, the millions of uh, Germans that were uh, implicated or should have been brought to justice, but that's true with regard to any mass atrocity. Any mass, mass crime involves numbers of people who will never be a, a part brought to justice. That should not even be a, an expectation. So it's all about a two steps sideways, one step in a different direction. It is not a, there's no linear progression in any of that. So yes, some root causes are being addressed. Sometimes you have, as I mentioned in Argentina, immunity, then there is more pressure, then there is more accountability. That's going back and forth. When I talked about identity-based, I talked about the relationship is whether we, precisely of the kind of conflict that we have, a, that we're dealing with in this workshop. Sometimes, and that's the ideal situation, Nadim, is when the disagreements are not identity-based. So if you have a Jews and Palestinians who would agree on whether it's post-colonial, anti-colonial, colonial framework or whatever, that's a legitimate disagreement that it can be professional and not identity-based. For me, that's a major achievement because in most cases, if you know who the writer is because of the content, that is a different situation than uh, the, the case that uh, Muge, for instance, described, uh, described right now. Uh, I don't have many minutes, so I'll, can I use Muge as your wonderful example as a reference to uh, Simon's question? That, I think, is a very good example, but we can, ex we can explicate it much wider. But basically, scholars who are close or like-minded can work together, that is, to my mind, the most uh, challenging, but feasible. Because we are all at some distance from the immediate political pressures. And the more that we open spaces for such discourse, the more likely it is that those discourses will expand. We had a conversation yesterday about, or at least some comments, about the place of the Nakba in the Jewish mentality, Jewish, uh, what shall I say, mentality, cultural space, whatever. Clearly, the more that it is expand, uh, expanding, it's not going to reach a saturation. It's going to, gray, to, to grow the legitimation of using the concept, the recognition of the uh, violence that was inflicted on the Palestinians will increase in legitimacy in the discourse uh, among the Jewish uh, part in Israel. Um, so, oh, I, I just left the good juices for, give me two minutes, okay. So, um, Omer, I, I'm not sure, what, a couple of things. First of all, Japan is not Germany. Although the similarities that you pointed to Japan and, Sam and Germany are correct, Japan did not apologize. That's exactly the, ex this, the, bo the best example we have that it's not just the defeat, it's not the, the, the power, the, the, the US domination or the allies domination, it is including, there's lots of things, but we can talk about it. The other thing is, you've been saying that for years and I quote you uh, gladly about it, you, in genocide you get away with murder. So, the uh, ethnic cleansing succeeds. I don't know of any ethnic cleansing that was ever reversed. I have 
one thing that I did, can I plug my own work? Uh, I published last year a book with a colleague which is called No Refuge and No Return. And the take home lesson of that study, which is 20th century global, is that no minority has ever repatriated, notwithstanding international norms or claimed international norms. There are enough expertise to shoot me down, and I'd be glad to know of examples where that one didn't take. To the Israeli Palestinian uh, consultancy, what is it? Right? You want, what would we consult the Israeli uh, government to do that? I think. No, I think that I, I'm, I'd be, I think Israel has a great opportunity to do a lot of things if it had a different government. But, allow, but allowing for acknowledgement progressively, preparing public opinion for, for greater recognition with minuscule cost and, with a, and the Palestinians' demands are so minimal that Israel can accommodate them so easily that it's just heartbreaking that nothing is being done in these directions. I can translate that if I had more time into particulars, but I think Yohi is really pushing me off, so thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is um, Simon Lenine. Simon is a leader in European philosophy in the European Institute and the London School of Economics. Um, his publications include uh, On Being of with Others, Heidegger, uh, Wittgenstein, the Ligam, the idea of continental philosophy, and in the name of phenomenology. Uh, since 2004, Simon has been the director of the Forum for European Philosophy. It is an educational charity bringing philosophy of all kinds to general public audience. Um, although his background is in European philosophy, he, is now, he now works in increasingly on philosophy of Europe. Thank you, Yoki, um, and to Amir and Roland and to everybody who's put this together. Um, so my talk today is going to belong to Alizar's fourth category of academic discourse, uh, uninformed by present political affairs. Um, I don't believe that, but uh, it'll look that way. Yes, we are all at a distance, perhaps no one more than a philosopher, and that is perhaps also why we need it. Uh, it disturbs illusions of proximity that academics fall into very readily. So we're going to do a bit of philosophy. And I want to begin talking about forgiveness under this title, I Forgive You, with two classic intuitions regarding forgiveness. These intuitions are profound, but also problematically metaphysical. And I mean that in this sense. They concern a mode of understanding what it is to be a human being that goes beyond the possibility of an empirical assessment or a quantitative calculation. At the end of my talk, by the end of the talk, I hope to try to formulate a position on forgiveness that's perhaps neither metaphysical nor simply empirical. I'll call it conceptual or phenomenological. But first, let me start then with these two classic metaphysical intuitions. Here's the first one. Human beings are, in their inherent nature, if not in all their typical conduct, good. Hence, if someone does something bad or commits some atrocious wrong, we will in fact always have a reason, a general reason, to forgive them. We can always suppose that a human being is not really or finally as bad as they presently appear to be. When I say, I forgive you, it means I'm willing to cut you some slack. There is, in you, something better. That's the first one. The second one says, human beings are, in their inherent nature, if not in all their typical conduct, bad. Hence, if someone does something bad or commits some atrocious wrong, we will, in fact, always have a reason, a general reason, to forgive them. We can always suppose that our own situation and condition is only contingently more favorable than the one the other has found himself or herself in. So when I say, I forgive you, it means that I am aware that I could have found myself derailed by circumstances too, 
There, but for the grace of God, go I. Okay, totally different views. We might think in both cases we always have a general reason to forgive. But does this general reason always have sufficient force to warrant an act of forgiveness on someone's part? Are there additional, let's say, concrete or particular conditions for forgiveness? Is everything, anything, always forgivable? Or is there a range of possibilities, not covering everything, in which forgiveness would be, as it were, rightly given, or rationally justified, as a philosopher might put it? Cases in which it makes sense to forgive someone, beyond which we will have to say, that is simply unforgivable. So the question in philosophical terms would be, what are the assertability conditions of this formula, I forgive you? So we have the idea of a, a distinction between possibilities of phenomena that are forgivable and beyond that range cases where forgiveness makes no sense or is rationally impossible. Now philosophers or a philosopher, might try to get some clarity on this putative distinction, and in particular to explore the logic of what one might call forgiveness worthy of the name. That is, the philosopher might suppose that his or her proper interest lies in giving some kind of analysis of the range of cases where forgiveness can be rightly given, delimiting the domain of the rationally forgivable. You told a lie. You tripped up a running man. Perhaps we have a general reason to forgive. But, one might want to say, that surely can be trumped by the atrocity of the act. Unless, that is, there are concrete or particular reasons which bring the act into the range of the rationally forgivable. You told a lie, but you told it to a murderer seeking out his victim hidden in your house. You tripped a running man but he was attempting to escape the scene of a crime. Someone who lies, perhaps lies a lot, without reason. Someone who regularly trips up innocent runners, without reason. That is perhaps unforgivable. So one thing to consider, says the philosopher, is the reasons which excuse otherwise unforgivable conduct. Well, is this the last word on rightful forgiveness? Are there any particular reasons to forgive an act which was in the circumstances of its taking place unforgivable? Can we still say that there could be a call to forgive? The philosopher says yes. Conditions of repentance can also change the assertability conditions of rightful forgiveness. What you did was unforgivable, but you were reformed, so I forgive you. What you did was unforgivable, but you have sincerely promised not to do it again, so I forgive you. What you did was un unforgivable, but in the general way we'll say, I have particular or concrete reasons for supposing your reform or future improvement so I will wipe the slate clean. I forgive you. Well, I want to spend some time now reflecting on the kind of case where something st strictly unforgivable is forgiven. I'm going to take this on by continuing to ventriloquize for a moment the classic philosophical analysis, and then I want to confront it by a recent and extraordinary resurgence of a model of forgiveness which has no assertability conditions at all, at least none beyond the general condition of humanity with which I began. So the classic philosophical interpretation begins with a subject, a person, with a certain, as it were, moral personality. This subject does something, let's say, rationally unforgivable. But then in view of either an actual or rationally anticipatable transformation of their moral personality, we are justified in forgiving them. 
It wasn't really you, or not the real you, not the you that you are now, and I forgive you. Well, two quick points on this. First, when we wipe the slate clean through forgiveness, we do not forget it was done. Forgiveness is not amnesty, not forgetting. This implies, trivially, but uh, with this I'm going to be touching on what will eventually prove a problem for the classical interpretation. This implies that forgiveness is given and should be given only to the right person, the one who did it, the one who did the wrong. In lucid recollection of how awful it was, we nevertheless regard the case for some reason as one in which forgiveness is rightly given or rationally assertable. Second, where the reasons forgiveness for forgiveness are not excuses or mitigating circumstances, the reasons that count for the classical view concern some, concern some sense of change or a reliable sign of potential change in their moral personality. Evidence of regret, remorse, apology, asking for forgiveness. Forgive me. I'm sorry, sincerely sorry, for what I have done. In the absence of excuses that there must be atonement. Otherwise it remains unforgivable. The assertability conditions of this little machine, I forgive you, are lacking. That's the traditional view. But as I've indicated, there have been recent contributions to philosophical discussion on the assertability conditions of forgiveness which reject the premise that the general condition of humanity is insufficient, or which comes to the same thing, conceptions which defend the extraordinary view that we always have a reason to forgive. Two philosophers in particular one from the so-called analytic tradition, David McNaughton, a British philosopher now working at Florida State University. The other, a so-called continental philosopher, now deceased, Jacques Derrida. Both argue, in closely related ways, that the classical philosophical analysis as I've run through it is problematic. In a series of papers, David McNaughton has outlined a powerful case for what he calls unconditional forgiveness. And they're brilliant, and you must read them. But despite their brilliance, it's not clear to me that his positive account of unconditional forgiveness shows up the defects in the classical requirement that offering forgiveness is conditional on atonement, repentance, apology, or asking for forgiveness. And I think there are defects in that account, specifically what I think is, in a way, a logical failure to do justice to something that holders of the traditional view themselves cannot deny. Namely, that forgiveness must forgive the wrongdoer. In Derrida's discussion, by contrast, this theme is central. Who, he asks, do we forgive? If so-and-so does something wrong, do we forgive someone else? No. According to our own concepts, this makes no sense at all. But now, and bearing this in mind, if the one we forgive is, according to the classical interpretation, the one who has transformed in their moral personality sufficiently, as evidenced in expressions of remorse, regret, apology, and so on, then isn't this just what we're doing? The subjectivity of this subject is sufficiently different now that we now feel justified in wiping the slate clean. I forgive you. But is this genuine forgiveness? Is this forgiveness worthy of the name? Well, let's say we see someone with no remorse at all, but only a hard heart. Someone utterly unrepentant. Can't we understand forgiveness to be rightly fitting here too? And indeed, and this is Derrida's famous claim, isn't this, in fact, the only possible forgiveness? Forgiving the very one who did the terrible deed. To forgive, we address the person. We look them in the face. We speak to the one who did the deed. I forgive you. 
But this means, in fact, on our own concept of forgiveness, the only possible forgiveness, the only forgiveness worthy of the name, is in a certain way the impossible forgiveness. We're called to forgive the one who did something unforgivable. That is, we are called to forgive without particular reasons, prior to a particular reason which would deliver the assurance that the I forgive you was rightfully given. David McNaughton expresses this with the thought that forgiveness is essentially supererogatory. It is, he says, in the nature of a gift, not something necessarily deserved, nor swapped in an exchange relation for repentance. Paradoxical as it may sound, McNaughton says, the wrongdoer does not deserve to be forgiven, and yet we forgive. Does this mean that we have to forgive without a final assurance that the other really should be forgiven? The very idea of final assurance is misleading here. It's the absence of any final assurance that opens up a space of responsibility that I suppose the other should be forgiven is always a matter of taking a stand, a commitment beyond knowledge, beyond certainty, and especially without assurance that I am a being capable of forgiving, without knowledge that the other's request for forgiveness is genuine and not simply opportunistic or strategic or expedient, which it may always be. So should one forgive everyone, forgive everything? I don't think so, not at all. However, unless we keep in view the moment of forgiveness as a gift, what Derrida calls the experience and experiment of the impossible gift, the experience and experiment of forgiveness beyond the forgivable, unless we keep the gift character of forgiveness in view, then we will end up sacrificing the very thing we want to save. What I mean is this. By the rules, as it were, that define the very concept of forgiveness in our culture, we come to see that no rules can shore up all the stops of anxiety concerning questions of entitlement to forgive. We can always ask, was it a sincere apology, a genuine request for forgiveness, and so on. Every effort to produce a translation or operationalization of the supererogatory gift, if he does this, this, and this, then we can forgive. Every attempt of that kind is problematic. Forgiveness cannot be normalized, must remain extraordinary even if its effectiveness requires, too, its engagement with real conditions of all kinds, psychosocial conditions, political conditions. Forgiveness takes place between the other and myself, but not simply as different moral personalities, but as beings both called to be capable of forgiveness, capable of forgiving and of being forgiven. And this I want to suggest in the closing remarks here. And this because we are alike in the singularity of our finitude. And I'm going to try and explain that. We exist as beings exposed to the possibility of the worst, exposed to the possibility of what's sometimes called radical evil in ourselves, in the other, beyond prediction, beyond all rational calculation. It could all go wrong. It could all go horribly wrong, even here. <laughs> what we're exposed to here are not present expressions of basically dark nature, a basically dark nature triggered by circumstances, but possibilities. We're exposed not to some present evil, but to the possibility of an, that belongs to an unpredictable existence. 
possibilities which cannot be excluded, and in fact which essentially belong to the horizon of every encounter with another as another. Even the best experiences with others will have had as part of their structure the chance that it might have all been terrible, even here. Even if it's just the coffee arrived cold. So going back to the original distinction between conceptions of our nature, the point is not that we're basically good or basically bad, but that we must live with others in an awareness that we're exposed to the possibility of the worst. But to live in this mode just is to relate to each other as beings capable of forgiveness. And hence it is also to cultivate the good, the better, the more humane. Forgiving the unforgivable. This is essentially the same as loving the unlovable, which we all are a bit. Or better, it's the same as loving the one who remains at a certain point beyond knowledge, beyond prediction. St. Augustine famously says that we must condemn the sin and forgive the sinner. The dissociation of the what and the who can find its radical justification in metaphysical conceptions of human nature. The other, like me, is basically good, so we should cut them some slack. Or the other, like me, is basically bad, so there but for the grace of God go I. But no, the Augustinian dissociation of the actual and the possible needs revision, I think. What we are exposed to is not always, in any case, actual evil by something potentially good or permanently bad. Rather, what we're actually exposed to is something constantly possible. The possibility of radical evil as the very horizon of anything worth anything at all. When I invite the other into my life, I'm exposed to the visitation of another who can destroy it. Learning to live with the other means learning to be a being capable of forgiveness. And it doesn't end. Thank you. I have two problems. The first is that you assume that the two people share the same value system. And by that I mean that uh, if you know, a Palestinian is called out, I'll give one example from a Palestinian, he's retired from conflict and one from the Nazis to confront different problems. The Palestinian is called upon, say, the claim is made that, that, that he makes himself claim that he should forgive him for stealing his land. But I don't recognize that I stole his land because I think it's my land. He was the squatter. So at some point, that, uh, it had, the forgiveness assumes that we have both agreed that either I stole it, that I did steal his land. Otherwise, what's the point? So that's one thing. Both sides have to agree that we're talking about the same thing. The other problem is a different problem, and it's raised by the Nazis, and that's the dialectics of evil problem. The dialectics of evil problem is I'm going to tell you an unpleasant story. I knew a man in Germany who, when the Russians got to his village, in West Prussia, they sat him down. He was a 10-year-old boy, and then he had to watch all day while his mother was being raped by Russian soldiers. Now, if you ask those Russian soldiers why they did that, and Omar Barkov will, uh, will verify this, the Germans destroyed countless thousands of villages in Russia the following way. They march in, kill all the men, rape all the women, in the morning kill all the women and march out. So the dialectics of evil, now this who's who am I supposed to forgive? In other words, once you're in the dialectics of evil situation, this little boy, you know, is who's he supposed to forgive the Russian soldiers to make peace with what happened to the Russian peasants? Where is his, you know, the, the dilemma, once you're in the dialectics of evil, is that you're sharing the anti-value, because you're already in the situation of radical evil. So forgiveness makes, I would say, requires two things. One is you're in a common system, and two, you're in the dialectics of good rather than of evil. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Simon. Two questions. One uh, is, uh, is asking for forgiveness something different from forgiving? I mean, that is, how do those two 
uh, related. I, I'm thinking a lot, uh, just in my mind as you were speaking, I was thinking about the Willy Brandt's famous knee fall. You know, he falls on his knees in Warsaw and sort of asks in some ways for forgiveness, you know, um, uh, for the Germans for what they uh, had done. And the other question that kept occurring to me is, as you spoke, I mean, as you analyzed the situation, this was very individual. It was I and you. Now, how does, and this probably relates to Gabby's question, how, how, how does this work with a society? How does this work with a polity or, a, or ethnic group or whatever? How, you know, how, how can the same kind of standards um, be applied from this individual set of problems, which I think I understand and can deal with, but to a society at large, which maybe can be spoken of for a from a government point of view, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to identify how this works socially. Thank you, Well, um, Simon, I, I enjoyed your your talk very much, but I remain uh, trapped within two images. One is a Catholic priest with very explicit signs that he is or she is, you know, for that purpose he is a Catholic priest. And the other one that he is a Catholic priest but he doesn't have the clothes. That I, like he doesn't have the signs that identify him as a Catholic no, no, priest. No, 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 no. And here is where, uh, you know, uh, here is where I, you know, seem to be a little bit uh, uh, confused about uh, you know, the context in which your analysis of for, forgiving is, is, is coming in. And one is that there is here a theology that is very, uh, you know, clearly very Christian theology of a very particular kind, not only Christian. It's a, it's a Christian theology of a very particular kind. Uh, this is A. And B, the polit political theology, which seems to be secularized in the way you were trying to kind of think remains within the remains within the boundaries of the forgiveness, which is still somehow a secularized version of a political theology that takes uh, forgiveness seriously. Okay, thus far this is interesting, but let us put this in the context of a political contestation. Uh, and I want to pick slightly on some of the things that are hidden or implicit in Gabby's point, if I understood it right, and that is that if we are in a political conflict, then why, for God's sake, we need at the very instance, you know, the language of forgiveness in the first place? I can may well be very good within this thing, you know, adopting an agonistic notion or even a different kind of ethics that might bring in uh, into the political discourse where I can say, well, you know, I can differentiate between where forgiveness can be relevant for certain issues, maybe in the context of marriage, but may not work even in the context of marriage or divorce, but also in the context of politics. You know, why, why would I, you know, why wouldn't something of an ethics of like, you know, criminal justice or other forms would be much more adequate than just, you know, going into the impossibility of forgiveness? Uh, and that, again, you know, I mean, even if you want to remain trapped within a notion of reconciliation, which is, you know, I mean, in, for, that, for that purpose, Hegel here is very uh, illuminating in, in this perspective, like, you know. But Nietzsche, in the, the, you know, coming back to the comments that I briefly touched on, is, is very interesting here because, you know, saying, you know, what about this, you know, reconciliation and forgiveness and all of this is, you know, it's, it's outside of, a, uh, you know, we can envision and, and conceptualize a different policy. But I didn't have to go all the way to Nietzsche to conceptualize a different, a different politics in which within it I don't need the whole entire concept of forgiveness, which seems to be very troubling rather than inviting in the context of conflict. Actually, my question was already uh, uh, okay. asked. No. So, Can I go with those three? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take them backwards from uh, one I know how to answer to one I don't. Um, uh, Bashir's question about the Catholic priest dressed and undressed, as it were, as a priest, um, maybe one could say, you know, am I here a, a, a priest undressed um, or a secularized forgiveness? I think this is terribly important, uh, and uh, I suppose I have to uh, accept this charge. Um, I do believe that the discourse of forgiveness as we see it in South Africa or even in Japan or in any, any other places where there are these calls for a head of state, for example, to apologize, these are uh, a movement of Christianization of the political discourse. And indeed, I've argued elsewhere and would hold, hold the same view here that what we call globalization is the movement 
of a worldwideization of, of a Christian world, which hits certain limits of resistance all over the place, uh, and inevitably. And so one might, at that point, want to retreat, 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 and say, let's, let's uh, have no more globalization of Christianity or no Christianization of the world, no further Christianization of the world. And maybe you can't stop it, but let's say, you know, as academics, go, I, I want it, I want it, I want, I want it to go away. But um, I think this movement of Christianization and secularized versions of it are uh, also connected with something that I, as an undressed priest, as it were, want to stand by, which uh, is the cosmopolitan trajectory of this discourse, where coming to us from Greek philosophy, from the Stoics, we have an idea that we may be particularized citizens of this or that place, but we are also citizens of the world. And we also have calls from the Christian tr tradition to say that uh, we are all brothers. This is not just a, a, a Christian discourse, but a, an androcentric one. But we are all brothers. Um, none of us are foreigners. We are all citizens of the world, as it were. And so I think that there is inside this Christianized movement also uh, a cosmopolitan trajectory moving towards the humanity of the other rather than there being Polish or Greek or German or uh, whatever. So this uh, movement in a culture in which its own particularity is the movement beyond particularity, that is the very movement of globalization. And I, I think although we have to be very conscious of its uh, internal tensions because it is such a Christianized movement, I nevertheless want to stand by it. In terms of the question of uh, forgiveness by a polity, um, the typical translation from the I and you to the we will basically be made through uh, a sovereign, through a head of state, and um, where they say, I, as it were, speaking for us, uh, for, apologize. So I don't think there's anything in principle problematic about that kind of transition. What I would want to add, however, is that this sovereignty is never given. N the, the sovereign who says, you know, I, I, I am the one who can speak for all, it's always, you know, who, who's the one? Who's the, who am I to speak for all? But I would say the same thing about myself, and I did mention this, that um, I have to be, as a being, as becoming a being capable of forgiveness, I have to ask myself whether I am someone who can forgive someone. So there's a kind of limited sovereignty in the structure, both at the personal and at the polity level. Asking for forgiveness is an extremely important dimension of this because it, it produces inside what should be a supererogatory act, the gift, some exchange structure of uh, you ask you ask, please forgive me, please forgive me, I'm sorry. And it produces in the gift structure a moment of exchange which is very problematic. But it's interesting to see at the international level that the domain in which forgiveness is being asked today of, is very often in the terms of what's called crimes against humanity. A very new concept, really. I mean, relatively speaking, very, very new for human beings, these crimes against humanity. And it's there, as it were, almost magnetically, that the discourse of Christian forgiveness gets taken up in the international sphere. Why? Because precisely it's a relation in which we're drawn into the horizon of the human. It's an understanding of the human as the one who is the being capable of forgiveness. And so when we produce for ourselves a discourse of 
crimes against humanity, probably also Bashir from a, 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 a discourse with European origin. Uh, we're again making this movement in the direction of the human. And uh, whether it's secularized or not, it, it holds itself in that space. But that's, that's I, as I understand it, why it comes about that a sovereign, as it were, the position of the head of state, may be in uh, the one who forgives for the crime against humanity. Finally, uh, 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 Gabby's questions. Um, you stole my land, but I forgive you. I never stole your land. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> but I think I think the interesting I think I think the interesting thing is the interesting thing there is that maybe you don't know, just as I don't know that I'm the one who can forgive. So the the Palestinian who says I forgive you, who's to say you're in a position to forgive? Yeah, who who who's to say who can forgive? Well, also, who knows who is the one to be forgiven? Perhaps the one who's to be forgiven doesn't know that they're the one to be forgiven. So I think that there is a, a dimension of uh, the structure of the supererogatory gift, even in the case where you're forgiving somebody who doesn't know they did you wrong. I can't answer your one about the dialectics of evil. Too, too difficult. Some hands up. Oh, now you have to answer your own question now. Yeah. It's your duty, okay. really. I think that we need to distinguish between the fact of forgiveness and apology. Forgiveness became part of the international discourse primarily after Tutu, Tutu, Desmond Tutu and the South African Commission. Nobody talked about forgiveness after the Holocaust. That was not an issue of forgiveness. Yeah, just as you described it as a Christian uh, phenomenon, that has its art. It's not clear. There's a very different, there is a very clear distinction to my mind between demanding apology and offering forgiveness. These are not exchangeable. Apology is a demand from a perpetrator. Forgiveness is a demand from a victim. Only the victim can give forgiveness. The perpetrator can ask for forgiveness, but cannot give forgiveness. The notion that the, I see forgiveness as an imposition on the victim. It's not a moral imposition, it's a religious imposition. It is very much a Christian discourse. I don't see it as an ethical or moral demand at all. I don't think that it's actually widespread. I think it was as a, as a result of the TLC was very widespread, but it's diminishing because who has the right to forgive in the name of whom is becoming very complicated. Beyond the story that uh, Gabby just described, but are children allowed to give in, 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 uh, in the name of their parents? Is it family members? Is it community members, etc.? So beyond the philosophical issues, I think there is very specific cultural and historical context which create real, to my mind, and that would be my answer to the question, irresolvable dilemmas or predicaments with regard to forgiveness. Thank you. And uh, answering your own question, if you could very, very briefly. You entertained the idea of these, four cat these five categories and, and said that there is a certain one, which is your fourth, which um, uh, was uninformed academic discourse uninformed by um, political affairs. Uh, and is there a virtue? Absolutely. Um, yeah, oh, OK. Uh, hello? Uh, thank you, it's beautiful. So I just thought that the situation in which, uh, which, which Gabby raised, you stole my land, I forgive you. No, I didn't steal my land. It seems to me your land. Your, your land. <laughs> that is something that we are going to discuss this as well. So this is actually the ultimate Christian Jesus-like image when Jesus says, forgive them, they know for they, they know what they are doing. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, 
Correct. Yes, I think it's the exact, the exact. <laughs> you know, you forgive the sinner whether he or she knows it yeah. or admits it. That was my answer. Yeah. Ah. To Gabby. Yeah. 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 Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I didn't. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was just a thought. So I wanted to, uh, to ask for your reflection. So why actually we forgive? It, do we forgive for ourselves in order to feel good? Moral, justified. Do we forgive? Do we forgive for uh, others? Do we forgive for a sense of a community, for a sense of a co of, of coherence, or of, of all of the above? I'm, I'm, I'm just interested to know or what, moving what you think. Or moving along. along. Just um, obviously, there is not there is no one one uh, thing. I just I'm curious to know what you think about it. And what about the situation in which a crime is so big <coughs> that you may move move on, but you don't feel that you are entitled to forgive, say, say the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So you say, no, I like Germans now, I'm going to Germany, I have no problems, I have German friends, but my family was exterminated at the Holocaust, and I, uh, I don't feel entitled, I don't, I'm not in the right. Yeah. It's, it's not my... I cannot take this responsibility, so so it's like that. So it's like this no man's land in which you have forgiven without forgiving. Just what you think about it. And then when you say about Christianization, I get you mean Catholicism, because Protestantism is a little bit different. Certainly, uh, some trends of of American ev evangelical. Uh, Christianity, they are not forgiving at all. They, these guys are quite, uh, they are quite harsh about the... Uh, so, I guess it's more with Catholicism. No, of course, remember, Tutu was a, 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 an Anglican. Yeah. yeah. Although, ah. this tried to be brief. Yeah, so, so what I wanted to say was, raised by, by Eliza and by Alon, so I, I, I just want to say, you know, there's a... There's a story by Salman Wiesenthal that you, I'm, I'm sure you know, The Sunflower, in the, which he tells about this uh, dying SS man that he meets in a hospital. And the SS man asks him, will you forgive me? And he goes away and he thinks about it, and he comes back and he says, no, I can't. I can't forgive him. And the story is this, who is to forgive? And in my sense, and here I just was really wondering the, how you put it, because it wasn't clear in your otherwise, I must say, quite brilliant talk. I, I was not clear about that. Um, as I understand it, forgiveness can be given on the personal level only by the aggrieved. That is, you who suffered from someone else can forgive that someone. I cannot forgive for someone else's suffering. And on that personal level, it would be the same as when we talk about genocide, a huge crime, millions of people killed. But we can talk about personal suffering. And in personal suffering, the child who suffers, it does not matter at all if that child suffered in one genocide or another, in a war or in ethnic cleansing, or because of an abusive father. And suffering is personal. Pain is personal. And forgiveness, that kind of forgiveness, is entirely personal. It is you who suffered do or do not forgive. It's your decision. I think that what you're talking about is collective. Now, if it is collective, <coughs> I'm not sure that the term forgiveness is appropriate. It could be reconciliation. And often, as many people said here, another generation, by those who actually no longer directly suffer, they can reconcile, perhaps. But if you cannot forgive for those who did, for those who actually suffered. That's my understanding of it, and I wonder if we can make the distinction here. Thank you. Sam, thank you for a beautiful talk. I take my inspiration for the question from Hannah Arendt and her discussion of forgiveness in the human condition. And I want to go back to this story about you took my land, would you forgive me? What do you expect? So in Arendt, you know, the only way to expect forgiveness is by action, by taking some kind of an action between the taking away of the land and the asking for forgiveness. So how do you factor this in? Maybe one way to expand that story is to say, well, 
you know, you took my land, now I have to do something, and then I may ask for forgiveness, and then you may forgive me. Mm. Just, uh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to emphasize what was discussed here about not only the Christian, but especially the Catholic background of thinking like this. And it's not only Jesus say, if you hit my back, uh, I give you the other just to hit again. Uh, especially the, the, the practices in Catholic Church. Uh, if you say, for example, I, not to the public, but to the priest, I confess something, you have the right to be forgiven So uh, by the priest. Uh, so if somebody like the Austrian Chancellor Franz Manitsky in 1998 once said, uh, we apologize and I want to follow Ella Sabakan, who not only who has the right to forgive, but who has the right to apologize for somebody else. If he says, uh, we apologize, um, we confess our guilt. So it's a kind of Catholic, I would say, reflex that he is forgiven by the whole, so to say, global community. And uh, if he was very, or, or he would be very upset, or he would, he would be very upset if this would not take place. So this is a really a reflex thing in the Catholic world. Just, uh, I, oh, that's, I, that's five already, no? Uh, okay, okay I'm the last one. <laughs> Please forgive us. <laughs> <laughs> there is a limit. <laughs> <laughs> I actually practice this myself as a scholar, because when I talk about uh, what happened with respect to denial, uh, when I give the talk, uh, I uh, draw upon Hannah Arendt, uh, uh, distinguish guilt from responsibility mm -hmm. and say I apologize uh, for your suffering. I am not guilty but I am responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is very interesting uh, because it is a, a, a Christian setting, you, I can literally feel in the whole room the tension sort of dissipating. So it is, I mean what's important there is Acknowledgement has a very significant emotional component to it. I mean, and when I talk to them later, uh, yes, you know, they come and they can't believe I said it. Am I still sane? What's happening? They say what is very interesting is they say they feel a, 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 an, emo, uh, an emotional relief. They feel like they are no longer trapped uh, by what happened to them. And that probably is the most significant. The other uh, thing I wanted to say is, unlike Christianity with Judaism and Islam, from what I know at least, uh, we are supposed to settle everything in this world, and you know, and we do not have anyone at least to forgive us. So that may be a good way to start the reconciliation <laughs> process. You know, maybe we can come up with another term than forgiveness that you know both Judaism and uh, Islam sort of. Uh, give uh, significance to. Okay. Only one footnote, sorry, one sentence. And this is the difference between Catholic and Protestant thinking. The Protestant reflex is responsibility. To say you have to do something if okay. you oh, so confess it's your guilt. The Catholic is that you have immediate forgiveness. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. 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 I don't think I said that. No, it's less than one sentence. Actually, Omar articulated it. better be an eight sentence. Say even better. <laughs> it's only by differentiating the personal and the collective. The Holocaust is the greatest example. You can't ask people to forgive people for that. It's a, it's a personal choice. If somebody wants to forgive, it's his personal or her personal choice. Yeah. Well, OK, good, OK. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, try to wrap together some of the wonderful questions by um, attending briefly to something that I didn't get a chance to uh, bring into the talk, which is about the gravity of the offense. Let's suppose we have a very grave offense. Um, and you have this Christianized discourse which says there should be this unconditional forgiveness. So sh that means that you always have a reason to forgive and uh, and I didn't know in a certain way that's the end of the story. So should we forgive uh, without any reason just because the other's a human being? And, or better, should we just forgive without any deliberation on the gravity of the offense and weighing issues about uh, to forgive, to not, not to forgive? 
This seems to me uh, very, very important. And I want to try to illuminate it just very briefly then with um, a comparison with the conditions of a just judgment in law, in law and in legal reasoning. Let's just suppose for the sake of argument that the judge or the jury in criminal law aims at a verdict which is just. We might ask, is it just if the verdict is arrived at by, let's just talk about the judge, singularize it just for ease of things, is it just if the judge simply and exclusively follows an already established pattern of legal reasoning, a pattern which will therefore just deliver an outcome without any regard of the singularity of the case and which is arrived at purely mechanically. This judge, we might say that his or her judgment is legal, but would we say it's just? On the other hand, what if the judge acts on a whim and doesn't deliberate at all, doesn't go through any legal reasoning, any uh, antecedent cases, no patterns of, uh, of established legal reasoning. He just goes on a whim, oh, I think you're guilty. Does, is this just? No. So there must be reasoning. There must be this effort of weighing the gravity of the case. But reasoning, this reasoning will have to lead to a moment of decision. And this is why it is a moment of responsibility. And it's not a pure act of a kind of a throw out, oh, you're forgiven. It's not like that at all. It's a moment of decision, which is not simply the programmable outcome of preceding causes. In the midst of law, in the middle of the law, we must decide. And we must decide, the judge must decide, without guarantee that it's just, without certainty that it's just, without, especially without good conscience. Ha <laughs> ha, I came to the just judgment, the just verdict. Without good conscience that the judgment is just. And so there is at this moment of the decision, which is the moment of the most radical responsibility, also a certain lack of sovereignty, of, as, as it were, of knowing that I'm the one who did the right thing here. Now let's bring this back to forgiveness. Is forgiveness, why do you forgive? Is it to have a good conscience? If that's, as it were, the uh, upshot of your forgiving, if you think, oh, look, look how good I am, I was the one who forgave, and I have a good conscience now, this is not forgiveness. This is not the purity of the supererogatory gift. Look at me, look at me, I'm the one capable of forgiveness. And there's a similar thing with confession. Somebody talked about, I confess, I confess. This is another uh, sort of similarly uh, religious schema. And we have a, equally a globalization of confession. I was very interested actually just listening to people throughout the last days a lot of people saying, I confess. It's, a, it's a, uh, confessing our guilt is becoming something we're, is being required of us, and I think it's something that we need to uh, um, be very careful about, particularly with respect to its relationship to the idea of a good conscience. The question about uh, uh, doing something, I think this is very important. I think that what I tried to suggest in the talk was that, that in a certain way, we in our culture, in supposing, I'm supposing that in a certain way, we are all in a certain way in the same culture here. We in our culture, in a way, have two concepts of forgiveness. One is the conditional one, which asks for the uh, apology, uh, awaits to be asked, uh, and which says, I only forgive if, and you lay down conditions, uh, so this conditional uh, um, uh, um, uh, forgiveness. But we also have the supererogatory act, the gift. And I think that I would agree with you, except I'd put it the other way around. I'd want to put it the other way around. It's not like do something 
making a change to the way in which you act and then the gift, the, the gift of the forgiveness comes in. It's rather that they're always inside each other, these two dimensions of the conditional and the unconditional. The, the, the pure gift in a certain way is, a, is an illusion, uh, maybe a Catholic illusion, uh, to, uh, to something which, um, like a miracle, some kind of miracle. But it, in reality, uh, the gift, the forgiveness, is uh, always intertwined, in fact, in this other kind of conditionality. And I don't think one should set the other before the other, uh, but that one has to uh, see that in setting down terms, as it were, we, are, uh, we mustn't lose view of the gift, character of the gift. And finally, um, uh, instead of talking about we're being called to be a being capable of forgiving, which I think actually is quite a nice idea, and I'm, I'm happy to think through that at the moment, you could think about it equally as being called to be a being capable of giving. And maybe that's a, a, a more um, religiously neutral expression. And finally, the Christianization as Catholic, um, although I think there's limited uh, um, uh, respects in which that's correct, I would think that it is perhaps also right to say that globalization of the sort that I'm talk talking about could be called, and indeed Derrida did sometimes call it, a globo-Latinization. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.